Hello, my name is Lynn Spina, and I will be your moderator today. Welcome to the workshop, Bone Health After Transplant. It is introduce today's speaker, Dr. Joy Wu. Dr. Wu is an endocrinologist at Stanford University School of Medicine. Her clinical practice focuses on optimizing bone health in cancer and transplant survivors. As vice chair of basic research in the Department of Medicine at Stanford, she also directs research on skeletal development and stem cell therapies for bones. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Wu. Thank you, Lynn, for that kind introduction. It's really a privilege to be here today to talk with you about optimizing bone health after a transplant. Let me start with some of the take-home messages that I hope you'll remember. Uh, the first is that bone loss is quite common after transplant, and that as a result, fractures can occur due to a condition called osteoporosis. These fractures uh, can be serious, but they are preventable. We'll discuss the factors that go into determining an individual's risk of having a fracture, and uh, discuss that this can be influenced by many factors. There are important lifestyle changes that can slow, but usually, unfortunately, not reverse bone loss. And finally, we will spend some time discussing osteoporosis medications and treatments, which when used properly can be quite safe and are very effective. Let me start by defining osteoporosis. This comes from uh, the Greek for porous bone, and it refers to a decrease in the amount of bone, or what we call bone mass, that leads to an increase in fragility of the bone um, and an increased risk of fracture. You can see here from the Interna International Osteoporosis, this is a rendering of what normal bone looks like. Uh, you can see it's quite thick and well connected. Um, and in an individual with osteoporosis, there is less bone um, and it's thinner in quality. It's estimated that half of all women um, and about 20% of men will suffer a fracture from osteoporosis in their lifetime. This is all individuals, not just those who've had a blood or marrow transplant. And importantly, there are approximately 300,000 hip fractures per year. And unfortunately, this comes with a very high mortality rate. About 20% uh, will not survive within that year. And fewer than half are able to resume independent living and walking again. So this is a disease that's important to prevent because, because of the devastating consequences. To put the uh, frequency of osteoporosis in perspective, the lifetime risk for an adult at age 50 for women, again, is 50%. Uh, this is higher than the lifetime risk of breast cancer, which is approximately 1 in 8 or 12% over a lifetime. And then the risk of having a fracture due to osteoporosis is similar to the risk of having prostate cancer, so in the range of 15 to 20% over a lifetime. This is a fracture cast uh, from the National um, Alliance for Bone Health, just showing that these are uh, representing the 5,500 fractures that occur every day in the United States due to osteoporosis, and that leads to a total of 2 million fractures per year. What are the bones that are affected by osteoporosis? The most common fractures occur in the spine or vertebral fractures. These can be quite painful. They can cause increased curvature of the spine and they can make breathing more difficult. The next most common type of fracture is wrist fractures, usually from somebody tripping, for instance, walking on the sidewalk or um, at home and landing on an outstretched hand can result in wrist fractures. Hip fractures, as I alluded to, are um, number approximately 300,000 per year, but uh, can be very devastating and lead to a loss of independence. And the remaining kinds of fractures that can occur typically uh, involve the pelvis or other bones in the skeleton. Now, this is osteoporosis in general for the population, 
I'm here today to talk about the risk uh, of bone loss that can occur after blood and marrow transplant. Depending on the reason for the transplant, transplant recipients can often have low bone mass even before the transplant, uh, depending on the disease and or the treatments that have been used um, in those conditions. And in studies, allogeneic transplant recipients have been reported to lose about 6 to 9% of bone mass at the spine, um, and even higher, 8 to 17 percent at the hip within the first year after transplant. And the other important point to make is that bone loss can occur very quickly, uh, as early as three months after the transplant. Now, why are transplant recipients at such risk for bone loss? There are a number of reasons that contribute to this finding. There is, of course, the underlying disease that led to the need for a transplant. Some of those diseases themselves can lead to bone loss. There can be, for women, low estrogen levels, or for men, low testosterone levels. Both of those uh, we call sex steroid hormones are very important for maintaining the amount of bone. And in particular, for women who go through menopause, that is generally a time when there is significant loss in the amount of bone that a woman has. And in women who have um, gone through treatments that might include total body radiation and or chemotherapy, they are sometimes uh, forced into what we call premature menopause uh, and lower estrogen levels than expected for age. Many individuals after transplants uh, may need glucocorticoid treatment either for immune suppression or for treatment of graft-versus-host disease. And while glucocorticoid treatment can be life-saving, it can be very tough on the bones and results in loss of bone mass. Immunosuppression is, of course, critical for the success of a transplant, but some of the medications used to suppress the immune system can also lead to bone loss. And other treatments, including radiation, chemotherapy, can directly impact the bone, as can other medications and comorbidities that can occur on the way to treatment with a transplant. These include uses of medications like heparin, which is a blood thinning medication. Diseases or medications that affect the kidney can impact the regulation of calcium and bone mass. Individuals who have issues with nutrition or malabsorption, either from being chronically ill or having intestinal issues. And finally, vitamin D is deficiency is quite common, um, either because of lack of sunlight exposure or um, being outdoors. So transplant recipients are at particularly high risk for bone loss because of the many risk factors. To give you a sense for the rate of bone loss, on the left-hand side of the slide, shown in the green highlighted boxes, um, are the normal rates of bone loss that occur with age. Um, so decline in bone density is a natural part of aging. In men, the rate of decline is approximately 0.5% per year with age. In women uh, who have been menopausal, postmenopausal, um, after the age of 65, uh, their rates of bone loss are a little bit higher, maybe 1% per year. And in women immediately around the time of menopause, that's the fastest rate of bone loss that we see under normal conditions. That can approach 2% per year. In the middle to right part of the slide, highlighted in a red box, you can see individuals who've received a bone marrow transplant. And on average, you can see that their rate of bone loss can be 3 to 4% per year. So significantly faster than we expect with aging. To show just one example of a study published in 2001, looking at 67 adults who had undergone allogeneic transplant, and they had evaluations for bone density before transplant. Osteoporosis is, as I've mentioned, a significant risk for fracture. Osteopenia is an intermediate condition. It's a, a risk, a susceptibility for bone loss 
it does not carry quite the same risk as osteoporosis. But you can see that 49% of these individuals already had evidence of low bone mass, either osteopenia or osteoporosis, even before the transplant. And importantly, within six months of the transplant, this number jumped to 67%. So within six months, two-thirds of individuals had evidence for bone loss after their transplant. This study was in adults, but other studies have shown that bone loss is also common in survivors of pediatric blood and marrow transplant. On the images on the right side of the slide, you can see that uh, the individual who's had a stem cell transplant has a greater amount of pink showing on this image, uh, which shows that there has been decrease in bone and an increase in fat within the marrow. Um, and this study also showed that even young adult survivors of pediatric transplant can be risked at spine fractures, something that we would not typically otherwise see until a much older age. In thinking about your own risk for bone loss, uh, the factors that contribute, age is quite significant. The risk of fracture rises rapidly as we get older. Lower bone density. If you've had a previous fracture, that raises the risk of future fractures, even if your bone density is normal, because it tells us that there's something about the quality of bone that makes it more susceptible to fracture. As we've mentioned, glucocorticoid treatment, whether for immune suppression or for graft versus host disease, can be very um, detrimental to bone mass. People who have a family history of osteoporosis, especially if one of the parents had a hip fracture, that increases an individual's own personal risk uh, of having a fracture. Individuals who are thin uh, can be at increased risk. Smoking is a risk factor for bone loss. Um, and so as smoking cessation is an important part of the lifestyle management. Excessive alcohol intake, uh, more than two drinks per day for women, more than three drinks per day for men, is another contributor to bone loss. Certain inflammatory diseases, such as rheumatoid arthritis, can increase risk. Um, and then certain other uh, specialty uh, diseases um, and medications. So how do you identify individuals who are at risk for bone loss? The standard test is something called a bone density test. Uh, you may also hear it referred to as a DEXA scan. DEXA or DXA stands for dual energy absorptiometry. These are the recommendations from one of the societies that um, focuses on bone health, uh, the American Society for Bone and Mineral Research. And there are recommendations in general for the general population of who should have a bone density test includes women over the age of 65, men over the age of 70, younger adults over the age of 50 who have a significant number of risk factors, as we discussed on the previous slide, anyone over the age of 50 who's already had a low trauma fracture, in other words, someone who fractured their wrist just tripping on the sidewalk, who had a spine fracture with minimal trauma, those individuals should be screened with a bone intensity test. And, and those who have a condition or medication associated with bone loss, like rheumatoid arthritis, glucocorticoids, or in this case, transplant. I recently had the privilege of sitting on the expert panel for the American Society for Transplantation and Cellular Therapy. It's an organization of professionals who care for patients after blood and marrow transplant. Um, and I was a uh, part of the committee that convened these recommendations for optimizing bone health management after transplant. And so I'd like to share some of the recommendations from this panel. The first is that bone density or DEXA scan and fracture risk assessment, what we call FACS, should be done um, if not before the transplant, then no later than three months after a transplant. Uh, even if a bone density scan was done prior to transplant, if a recipient is on high doses of glucocorticoids immediately following the transplant, then another bone density scan should be ordered again at three months. And after one year of treatment, 
uh, and then following every one to two years after that. So what is the density, bone density scan? This is what the machine looks like at our hospital at Stanford. Uh, it's uh, non-invasive. It means that you just lie on this table uh, and this takes an image both of your spine and your hip. Um, and it turns out a report uh, both of hip and spine bone density. The green bars just indicate where normal bone density is. Um, and as it gets lower, uh, you get towards the higher risks of fracture. The blue bars show you what the average bone density would be for the population. These are compared to reference databases of uh, the same gender and race and ethnicity. So for this individual, the bone density is uh, pretty average for age. And you can see that uh, across the population, bone density declines as we get older. Once we have the results of the bone density scan, we can also use this calculator called FAX that takes into account things like age, gender, height, and weight. Other risk factors that we discussed, things like having had a previous fracture, whether a parent has ever had a hip fracture, whether an individual is a current smoker on glucocorticoids or has diseases like rheumatoid arthritis. And in the red box in the bottom right, uh, the calculator will estimate the risk of having a fracture in the next 10 years, either any kind of fracture called a major osteoporotic fracture or a hip fracture. And the guidelines for treatment suggest that somebody who has a major osteoporotic risk of fracture greater than 20% or a 10-year risk of having a hip fracture greater than 3% because they are so devastating should be considered for treatment. I'd like to make a few points about fracture risk. I mentioned that it was dependent on both bone density and age. This slide shows the effect of age on a risk for um, fracture. So the dotted line across the bottom is the 10-year uh, estimated risk of hip fracture at 3%. That is where the professional societies agree that we should think about treatment when that risk crosses the 3% threshold. Along the bottom, I have the bone density T-scores, and osteoporosis is defined by the World Health Organization as a T-score of minus 2.5 or worse, and that's shown by the red arrow on the bottom of the slide. T-scores are standard deviations compared to young adults uh, individuals of the same gender and ethnicity. So what you can see is that, um, and then I have the risk uh, of fracture for each age at five-year intervals from 55 to 80. So what you can see is that a 65-year-old woman um, roughly crosses the 3% line at a T-score of about minus 2.5. Um, so a 65-year-old woman who has a T-score of minus 2.5, that's right at the borderline of osteoporosis, uh, meets the threshold for treatment. On the other hand, if you are 80 years old, you can see that even at a normal bone density of minus 1, uh, that individual's risk of fracture is already very close to 3%. Conversely, for those who are younger than 65, uh, as for instance, a 55-year-old woman, her T-score could be closer to minus 3 before it reaches the threshold for treatment. So again, fracture risk is very much dependent on both bone density and age. The number of risk factors also matters. So this is a hypothetical case of a woman who is 65, weighing 150 pounds, 5 foot 6 inches in height. And her calculated risk of hip fracture over 10 years depending on the number of risk factors that she has. Um, and those are listed on the right. They include things like having had a previous fracture herself, having a parent with a hip fracture, being a current smoker, being on glucocorticoids or steroids, having a disease such as rheumatoid arthritis, or consuming excessive amounts of alcohol. And you can see in the graph that the risk of fracture rises very quickly with an increasing number of risk factors. So your doctor, when you speak with him or her, will factor in the number of risk factors that you have in trying to assess your overall chances of having a fracture. 
All right, let's talk about what we can do lifestyle-wise to improve bone health. The recommendations from the Surgeon General's report uh, in 2019 offers a few lifestyle interventions that can be very beneficial. Get enough calcium and vitamin D. We'll go into that in more detail on the next slide. Be more physically active. Exercise has many benefits, including uh, lowering the risk of fracture. Um, reduce your risk of falls. So this is, um, means things like making sure that if you have rugs, uh, throw rugs or small rugs, area rugs, that they are uh, well tacked down on the floor or just get rid of them completely. Um, that you perhaps have a nightlight um, for those uh, middle of the night trips to the bathroom so that you don't trip and fall in the dark. Uh, wearing shoes that are uh, comfortable and safe. Maintaining a healthy weight is another, another important approach. Um, don't smoke, or if you do currently smoke, work on stopping. Uh, limit alcohol use. And finally, share with your doctor any medications that you might be taking that could be weakening your bones. How much calcium should you be taking? So I counsel my patients who are at risk for bone loss. It's older adults or those who have the risk factors we've talked about. To get in the range of 1,000 to 1,200 milligrams daily. This is from all sources. Dairy products are a terrific source of calcium. I've listed here a few um, milk, yogurt, cheese. Each serving of dairy products is roughly 300 milligrams. So three to four servings a day would be sufficient. You can also get calcium in other sources of the diet. Orange juice is often fortified. Um, cottage cheese, uh, other foods have calcium. If, uh, if you're not someone who uh, enjoys having three to four servings of dairy products per day, many adults do not, uh, you can take calcium supplements. The important thing to remember is that your body can only absorb about 500 milligrams at a time. And so if you're going to take calcium entirely from supplements, you might want to divide those doses into 500 milligrams in the morning and 500 in the evening. If you're taking acid blocking medications, so H2 blockers, proton pump inhibitors, you need a form of calcium called calcium citrate. But otherwise, calcium carbonate is fine. Um, calcium citrate is marketed under brand names like Citracal. Calcium carbonate is available as Oscal or Tum. Um, in, in many generic forms. Vitamin D is also important. It helps your intestines to absorb the calcium with high efficiency. And for most individuals, the recommended um, intake for vitamin D uh, for those who are at risk for bone loss is in the range of 800 to 1,000 international units a day. We have two forms of vitamin D available. Vitamin D2 is a plant-based supplement to vitamin D3 is the form that we naturally produce in the skin when we have sun exposure or an animal base. Both of those are fine uh, to get you to that goal. Let's talk about exercise. Uh, the recommendations of the American Heart Association are that we get 150 minutes of moderate exercise, for instance, walking, or 75 minutes of vigorous activity a week. To make it easy, I recommend for most of my patients that they be active for at least 30 minutes per day, and then on top of that, strength training two to three times a week, either using weights or resistance bands um, is very beneficial for bone health. Balance and flexibility are also important and are also things that can decline with age. So um, yoga, Pilates, those kinds of exercises can also be very helpful. And if you want more information, the Na National Osteoporosis Foundation has guidelines for lifestyle interventions, including some suggestions for exercise that you can find on this URL shown here. In the last few minutes, I want to cover medications for uh, the treatment of osteoporosis. And, and the first question is always, do you need medication? And so by now, <clears throat> you would have had a bone density scan. Uh, you would have had a FRAX calculator. Um, and in the guidelines from the expert consensus panel and from uh, bone marrow transplant societies, uh, these are the general recommendations. So for individuals who do not require glucocorticoids, for example, for GVHD, 
Um, it's recommended that medication be considered for those who had a fracture after age 50. Again, this is a low trauma fracture, so um, breaking a wrist, tripping on the sidewalk, or perhaps having a spine fracture. Um, postmenopausal women or men over the age of 50 who have osteoporosis on a bone density scan, meaning a T score lower than minus 2.5. And finally, the third category is those who have an estimated 10-year risk of major osteoporotic fracture greater than 20% or hip fracture greater than 3%. For those who are taking glucocorticoids for GVHD, it depends on age. Individuals who are over the age of 40, um, it's similar to the recommendations before that if you've had a fracture, um, that should probably say history of fracture over age 40. Um, again, postmenopausal women or men over the age of 50 who have osteoporosis on abundant city skin. And this time for those who have an estimated 10-year risk that's a little bit lower, so only 10% for major osteoporotic fracture and 1% for hip fracture. Because age uh, plays a significant role, uh, adults who are under the age of 40 are quite protected from fracture. Um, and so treatment for young adults is only recommended if they've already had a fracture or if there's evidence of very severe or rapid bone loss. And finally, what are the approaches for treating osteoporosis? So the amount of bone that you have, I often tell my patients, is a balance between bone that is being newly formed, uh, analogous to the bricklayer on the right, um, compared competing with bone that's being broken down. Um, analogous to the jackhammer on the left. So we have two general strategies for treating osteoporosis. We can either stop bone breakdown uh, on the left, or we can actively promote bone formation. And I've shown some of the categories of medication on either side. There is very little data for the safety of bone building medications in individuals with history of blood and marrow transplants, or with malignancy, and for that reason, I don't recommend them, um, except in very special circumstances in close consultation with a specialist. So we're not going to talk about the medications that promote bone formation. The vast majority of medications used to treat osteoporosis fall in the category of preventing bone breakdown. And in particular, I want to highlight the category called bisphosphonate. These are the medications that are typically used uh, to treat osteoporosis in transplant patients. Uh, in the upper row is oral bisphosphonates. Uh, you may be familiar with some of them by their brand names, uh, Fosinax, Actinil, and Boniva. Highlighted in bold are the two that have been approved for the treatment of glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis, so particularly re relevant for those who are on high doses um, for example, for GVHD. Most of these medications are given as weekly tablets, uh, except for Beniva, which is a once a month tablet. The advantages of these medications are they're very safe and effective. They significantly lower your risk of fracture. Some of the disadvantages, um, they can be associated with heartburn uh, because the pills can be irritating for the esophagus. Um, these medications are somewhat limited for individuals who have kidney disease or lower kidney dysfunction. Um, and finally, Beniva or Ibandronate is not in bold because it has not been uh, shown to reduce all kinds of fractures. So there is a preference for using Alendronate, which is Fosamax, or Lucedronate, which is Actinol. For those individuals who have heartburn who can't tolerate the pill form, I recommend intravenous bisphosphonate, the middle row, uh, called zoledronic acid or marketed under the brand name Reclon. This is a very convenient medication. It's an intravenous infusion that's given once a year. Uh, it has a very similar efficacy. It's very effective at decreasing fracture risk. Um, the disadvantages, again, it cannot be used in those who have significant kidney uh, dysfunction. Um, and some individuals tell me that they get a mild flu-like reaction, particularly with the first infusion. Um, if anyone has had their COVID vaccine, the 
symptoms are very similar to what's been reported um, for the vaccine reaction. But that's largely with only the first infusion, and future doses don't seem to trigger the same reaction. There's a second overall class of medication that can be used to treat osteoporosis by preventing bone breakdown, um, and that's a medication called denosinab, marketed under the name Prolia. It's a monoclonal antibody against a protein called rank ligand. It's given as an injection in the clinic every six months. The advantages are that it can nicely increase bone density and is an option in those who have some kidney dysfunction. However, there are very few safety and efficacy data in blood and marrow transplant recipients, although there are trials ongoing. So I generally recommend the first two categories, either oral or intravenous bisphosphonate. Now, I've been practicing medicine for a very long time, and I've heard uh, many of the concerns that uh, people come into my clinic with. Um, there's a natural uh, inclination to favor natural remedies over medications when possible, um, to uh, emphasize lifestyle instead of medication. I have um, many patients who note that they are sensitive to different kinds of medications. Uh, there have been reports in the media that have made people somewhat nervous about some of the osteoporosis medications. And then it's uh, not uncommon that somebody might have a personal connection with someone who took a medication and had an unpleasant side effect, for instance, heartburn. So I want to put into perspective the benefits and risks of treatment. And shown here uh, in gray bars are the number of fractures that would happen in um, 100,000 patient years. So for instance, if we had 10,000 women treated for 10 years, you would expect several thousand spine fractures over that time, a fewer number of wrist fractures and a smaller number of hip fractures. Bisphosphonate um, used over this time would significantly decrease. You can see here it um, cuts down by several thousand the number of fractures, also decreases the number of wrist fractures and hip fractures. The long-term, very rare side effects of bisphosphonates include osteonecrosis of the jaw and what we call atypical fractures. You can see that these are exceedingly rare and, in fact, only seen in individuals who've been on medication uh, for more than 10 years, especially in the case of atypical fractures. So to reframe in a different uh, way, this is for uh, a number uh, a representation of the number of fractures that could be prevented by treatment. So this is the benefits of treatment compared to the number of cases that you might see of osteonecrosis of the jaw or atypical fractures after five years of treatment or 10 years of treatment. So at treatment durations of five years, you can see that there are very few um, adverse events compared to the numbers of fractures that can be prevented. So in appropriately subject, uh, selected patients, uh, the benefits of five years of treatment um, far outweighs the risk. And with that, I want to uh, return to the take-home messages. Um, we've talked today about the fact that bone loss can be common after transplant for a variety of region, reasons, that fractures that result from bone loss or osteoporosis can be serious but are preventable, that a person's risk of fracture depends on several factors, including age, bone density, previous factor, fracture history, family history, um, and medical conditions. Uh, lifestyle changes can certainly slow the rate of bone loss, but if somebody has osteoporosis, it's typically not enough to reverse uh, the bone loss. Um, and therefore, we need to think about medications. But when used properly, these medications are very safe and effective. And with that, I thank you for your time, um, and I believe we have time to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Wu, for this informative presentation. Uh, we will now take questions. As a reminder, if you have a question, please type it into the chat box on the lower left-hand corner of your screen. So the first question is, what is the risk for a patient who had an autologous transplant, and that is for those who um, are not 
sure what that is. That's a, a transplant using your own cells. Right. That's a great question. So the risk of bone loss um, is influenced uh, after transplant is influenced by a number of things. So both the initial reason for the transplant um, and the conditioning regimen. So if the conditioning regimen is, um, let's say, less stringent for an autologous, then uh, the risk may be slightly lower, um, but still something that uh, an individual's physician should be aware of. Thank you. Um, this is a question about um, calcium and vitamin D, which you did touch upon, but specifically um, this person is saying that she is a woman of 70 years old and how much calcium and vitamin D should she take? Right. So um, to keep things simple, I generally recommend to my patients that they take 1,000 milligrams of calcium. And again, that can be diet or supplement uh, combined. Um, if it's supplements, it should be no more than 500 milligrams at a time because your body can't absorb more than that. Um, and, and then for vitamin D, also 1,000, but this time it's international units. Um, and there, uh, as long as those totals are met, it, it can be done any number of ways. I have patients who take combined calcium and vitamin D supplements. Um, I have individuals who prefer to get the calcium from diet to, for instance, dairy products that take a vitamin D tablet. Um, so as long as it's roughly 1,000 milligrams of calcium and 1,000 international units of vitamin D. Thank you. The next question, after stopping steroids, how long does it take for the bone to heal? Is it necessary to take medication to repair the bone? Not, uh, it depends on how much bone loss there has been, um, and uh, it also depends on the cumulative amount of time and the dosing of the glucocorticoids or the steroids. Uh, so for somebody who has had very substantial bone loss well into the osteoporosis range, it's unlikely that the body can recover entirely on its own, even when steroids are stopped. However, for somebody who's been on low doses for only a brief amount of time, uh, the body might be able to recover from that. Okay. Uh, multiple myeloma patients often take high dose dexamethasone once a week. Does that confer the same risk of taking glucocorticoids for GVHD? Yes. So dexamethasone is a form of glucocorticoids and uh, high doses uh, increase the risk substantially of bone loss. Multiple myeloma in itself is one of the diseases that uh, can cause bone loss. The myeloma cells um, can eat away at the bone. Uh, and so these individuals would be in the category of high risk. Next question. Who do I go to for a bone test? I am four years out from transplant and no one has suggested it. Right. So. Um, a couple of options. You can ask your primary care physician. Um, they're often the front line recommendation, uh, recommenders, um, and they can order. Or you can discuss with your bone marrow transplant uh, physician. One of the reasons I participated on this expert panel was to raise awareness among physicians who care for patients with uh, blood and marrow transplant um, that bone loss can be an issue um, and to um, increase awareness of who should be screened. So, you could take, for instance, um, the slides from this talk and uh, share them with your transplant physician. Um, and if uh, it's agreed that you fall in the categories of risk that I discussed, um, then to order a bone density scan. Thank you. Is osteopenia or osteoporosis still a significant risk factor if the patient never received steroid treatment or developed GVHD during or after the transplant, but did have TBI, total body irradiation. Sure. So TBI can also affect the bone. Um, the radiation passing through the bone cells can have uh, effect on the ability to form bone uh, normally. Uh, and so the um, risk conferred by osteopenia and osteoporosis uh, is still present. Um, exactly how high that risk is depends, again, on the age of the individual, um, whether they have other risk factors. Um, but you can have 
uh, osteopenia and osteoporosis from TBI alone or even without any of those treatments. Okay, next question. Does ProJAF or JAFFA affect bone health? Um, I apologize, I'm not an oncologist, so I'm not familiar with the medication with them. But I can tell you that many of the um, medications used for transplants um, can have secondary effects, for instance, if somebody went into uh, premature menopause. But I, I can't comment specifically on the oncology medication. Okay. The next question. I am 11 years out from BMT. I have a vascular necrosis in hips, knees, and ankles. I've been told by orthopedic specialists that they cannot perform stem cell therapy on me to treat my hips, and they tear in my L4 and L5. What research is being done using stem cell therapy on BMT survivors? So avascular necrosis is a common complication of high doses of glucocorticoids, um, but it's a separate condition from osteoporosis. Uh, it refers to the fact that sometimes parts of the bone lose their blood vessel supply um, and, and then have trouble uh, functioning normally. So um, that's a question that's best discussed with um, somebody, as an orthopedic surgeon, for example. Okay. Um, here's another one about avascular necrosis. I am 35 years post-transplant and have avascular necrosis in my joints. First question is, um, is hyperbaric oxygen treatment an option to reverse further damage? And if a joint replacement is required, is it important to have it performed by someone experienced with BMT patients? So again, avascular necrosis is a different condition. It's treated by orthopedic surgeons, um, and I, I can't really comment. It's not my specialty. Okay. What if you have an overactive parathyroid gland that elevates calcium levels? Is that good for bone health? If not, what do I do about it? So an elevated PTH level, or um, a condition we call hyperparathyroidism, uh, is quite common uh, and um, becomes more common as uh, adults get older. Um, it can lead to high calcium levels, and um, when that happens, it is not good for bone. Uh, so elevated calcium levels and continuously elevated PTH levels um, are actually associated with osteoporosis. So um, the primary treatment uh, for hyperparathyroidism is removal of the parathyroid gland that is making too much PTH, um, but that's something that should be discussed with uh, an endocrinologist um, and an endocrine surgeon. Okay. I have been on prednisone for some years. Apparently, this is what has thinned my spine, leading to stenosis. What can I do? So um, prednisone leads to an overall thinning in the amount of bones that um, is osteoporosis and um, raises the risk of fracture. Uh, and for that, um, generally the recommendations are treatment with the medications that I discussed, um, so bisphosphonates in particular. Um, in terms of stenosis, that sounds like an anatomic issue, um, and that would be in the domain of a surgeon, a neurosurgeon or an orthopedic surgeon. I think the next question came from someone who had a pediatric transplant 10 years ago. Uh, they had no GVHG and no fractures. They said, I have never had a bone density scan before. I did have a severe jawbone infection two years ago. My primary care physician did not recommend a density scan because I'm in my 20s. Should I be concerned about my bone density? That's a great question. Um, most of the bone density research has, of course, been done in um, older adults because that's where it happens most commonly. Um, and, and we don't have a 
large amount of information for young adults. Um, I think it's a conversation to have with your primary care physician or your transplant physician um, about whether a screening bone density might be helpful, perhaps as a baseline. It's unlikely in somebody who is only in their 20s, um, unless they have had a fracture history or very, very severe osteoporosis, um, it's unlikely that it would merit medication, um, but it might still be a good idea to know where you're starting from as you get older. Thank you. Right, Does vitamin K help with bone health? So there are studies on vitamin K, um, preclinical studies, meaning in animals that suggest that it's beneficial. Um, and vitamin K is certainly an important part of some of the enzymes that work in bones. Um, but to my knowledge, there has not yet been a large clinical trial in people to prove the benefits of vitamin K. So uh, stay tuned, but it's not currently one of the recommended supplements. Okay. Is the bone damage caused by multiple myeloma the same kind of bone damage caused by osteoporosis? The um, bone damage caused by multiple myeloma, um, it both aggravates the normal process of osteoporosis, but uh, the myeloma cells themselves can contribute to destruction of bone. So uh, it is a little bit different than osteoporosis alone. Okay. Um, is there a rest period after five years of bifosphonate therapy? How long is that rest period? That's a great question. So as I showed, the risk of these very rare side effects like jaw necrosis or atypical fractures appears to be related to the length of time on treatment. Um, so for most individuals, I recommend a drug holiday um, or a pause from the medication after five years, as long as the risk from fractures is not too great. Um, the length of the drug holiday for most individuals should be one to two years. Within one year, the risk of jaw osteonecrosis and atypical fracture goes back to almost zero, or baseline, I should say. Um, within two years, the risk of regular osteoporosis fractures begins to rise because there's um, treatment has been paused. Okay, thank you. I was given Lodronix. First year, no problems. Second year, side effects of major muscular weakness for 48 hours. What would be an alternative as I am scared to take it again? Yeah, I don't understand. Um, so uh, I can't comment on the specifics. I'm not um, familiar with the details, but uh, it is more uh, common to find that those who have a reaction to zoledronic acid or reclass um, experience it the first time, um, and it typically gets better the second time uh, or future doses. So um, it's a little unusual to have a, a worse reaction the second time, so I would be sure to um, talk to your doctor about whether anything else might have been going on. But um, the uh, uh, I think it, it very much depends on uh, individual circumstances, so I can't really provide medical advice on this one. Okay. Um, the next question is from a person that likes to run. After the transplant, is running advised for a man over 70 if he has been running regularly for over 30 years? Running is a great exercise. I think um, if you, especially if you've always been a runner, um, my patients who are runners tell me that they, they really can't stop. It's a part of their life and a very important part of um, their health, both physical and mental. Uh, so there's no reason you can't run with osteoporosis. You, of course, want to be careful that you, um, for instance, your shoelaces are double knotted. Um, take every precaution you can not to trip and fall. Um, I would say that for anybody thinking about bone health, it is also important to build strength training into your regimen, uh, so two to three times a week, um, either with weights or resistance bands, but there should also be some emphasis on tra uh, strength training. Okay. Um, does it matter what type of food I take vitamin D supplements with? I have read online that vitamin D should not be taken within an hour of drinking milk, for example. 
I, um, I generally don't restrict the timing of vitamin D. Uh, it's well absorbed, and um, I, I'm not familiar with any recommendations. Uh, calcium, sometimes um, it's more about not taking it with medications. For instance, thyroid hormone replacement. Um, calcium can block the absorption of thyroid hormone. But um, for vitamin D, uh, I generally don't uh, restrict the timing of that medication or that supplement. Sorry. Okay. Does having an autologous transplant increase the risk of osteoarthritis? Osteoarthritis is uh, generally something that occurs uh, from wear and tear um, and is quite common as we get older. So I'm, um, I'm not a rheumatologist, but I don't think I can think of a reason why um, an autologous transplant would specifically increase the risk of osteoarthritis. Okay. Um, the next question. I have multiple myeloma, and after transplant, I am now given Zomato by IV infusion once a year. I also take Citrocell over the counter. Is that all right? I do have osteopenia. Right. So Zomato um, is another name for Reclass, the intravenous medication I mentioned. Um, it's a very good medication for those with uh, myeloma or after transplant. Um, so this certainly sounds reasonable. I, I would say that you should discuss with your physician how many years you might be treated before considering a holiday if appropriate. Um, and then another question. Do you have comments on Digiva? Exgiva is um, another name, a different dosage for the medication uh, Prolia that I discussed. Uh, as an alternative to bisphosphonate. Um, it also blocks bone breakdown. It is most commonly used by uh, oncologists for uh, cancers that have spread to the bone. For instance, um, uh, breast cancer, lung cancer. It can be used in myeloma patients who have bony involvement. Um, it is a higher dose than prolia, but uh, works in the same way. Uh, for transplant patients, I mentioned that there is still not a whole lot of data on the safety of Exgiva after transplant, um, and so I, uh, it is not my preferred first-line treatment, um, and I would um, recommend caution. All right. Other than dairy and supplements, what other foods can increase calcium? Other sources of calcium include fortified orange juice, um, uh, firm tofu, uh, green leafy vegetables do have some calcium. Um, for instance, uh, canned salmon or sardines, especially if the bones are present, uh, are there. Uh, you can Google um, for the list of calcium-containing foods and how much calcium is present. Uh, the National Osteoporosis Foundation has such a list. Um, and you can uh, you can sort of build up in your own you can sort of assess your own diet and how much calcium might already be present. All right, next question: Are there situations when zoldronic acid would be given more frequently than yearly? If so, what are the risks if given quarterly versus yearly? Yeah, so um, zoldronic acid or zomata um, can be given. Uh, monthly or quarterly for individuals who have cancer that has spread to bone. Um, it is a higher dose than we use for osteoporosis, uh, which is once a year, um, but it, the oncologists do use it at a more frequent dosing for um, metastatic breast, lung, uh, also sometimes for myeloma. Uh, it, it is very effective at decreasing the adverse events of cancer in bone, things like fractures or spinal cord compression, um, those sorts of adverse events, um, but it also at this dose increases dramatically the risk of um, osteonecrosis of the jaw and atypical fractures. Thank you. Um, I noted in your chart, Boniva is shown as a tablet monthly. I'm receiving three milligrams IV every three months. Is this as effective? 
I have an avulsion fracture of anterior inferior iliac sting and cal calcaneus fracture since being on Boniva. Right. Um, you're right. So Boniva is um, uh, one of the bisphosphonates that is available both as a monthly tablet in oral form and uh, for its, um, quarterly intravenous infusion. Um, for osteoporosis, it is um, quite effective, so it's a, it's a good choice. Um, it has not been proven to sh decrease uh, as many kinds of fractures as the other um, bisphosphonates. However, um, any of them is far better than not having any treatment alone. So it is an effective medication. All right. Now we're winding down. We just have a few more minutes left. So I'm going to take this last question. Um, and it is, I have had two bone density scans after my BMT. Interesting is that the last one in 2020 showed improvement in my bone density. Is this a good indication of decreased fracture for me at my age, 66 years old? Right, so um, I can't comment on details without looking at the bone density. Um, it, sometimes happens in, it sometimes happens that if an individual had a bone density while they were on, for instance, high juice glucocorticoids, um, and then years later had a second one um, not on that you might see some recovery, um, but it would be important for your doctor to look at the um, report carefully to make sure that it wasn't um, uh, any kind of technical artifact. 